I already told you who I was. Uh, this is Ares for Program Coordinators in a nutshell. Uh, just a few disclosures. Uh, I am Program Manager for ob Guide Fellowships, like I said, at the Cleveland Clinic, so I do the job that you guys do. Uh, I also, on the side, in my spare time, uh, operate as an independent medical education consultant. So um, recently I was asked to do this presentation for the anesthesia group. So the, the, uh, the PowerPoint was made in regards to having time constraints. So ignore some of that because that's what this video was made to make up for the things I wasn't able to talk about then, but also to cover the things I did talk about then so that people that weren't at that meeting or in that call um, can get the information as well. So I'll go over the overview of what ARIS is, uh, how to access it, and then we'll navigate through the software. Uh, just a preface, because I don't work for AMC, so I do not have a test program. And of course, there's confidentiality with sharing my screen. Uh, so what I did was did as many screenshots as I could and gave as, as clear of instructions as I can. Like I said, you can also review the ARIS webinars to see the more on-screen stuff. And of course, open your ARIS and play around with it once it is open. Um, so we'll go over the overview, dashboard, applications, the scheduler, ranking, setup, program messages, and bulk print requests. So introduction, what is ARIS? So ARIS is a product of the AAMC. I'm already getting to the alphabet soup for those, those of you that may be brand new spanking coordinators and do not realize what the heck I'm talking about. So ARIS stands for Electronic Residency Application System, which is a tag me study term. Um, and it is basically how all aspiring residents and many aspiring fellows, depending on if they're especially uses ARIS, apply to their programs, but all residencies for sure. The AAMC stands for the American Association of Medical Colleges, and that's the association that supports medical students, medical student teaching, transition, and of course, because of that, the transition from medical school to residency. So they, they delve into a lot of topics that have to do with um, the medical education system and how things are working together, and they're very big advocates uh, nationally for everything to do with basically what we do every day. So the A, why am I telling you all of this? Because it's all going to make sense in a second. <laughs> I am, um, the AMC has many products that utilize the same login. I did this job for, I don't even know how many years before I realized all these things were linked together under the AMC. Never realized it all that time. And I was just thrown all kinds of things to do. And I'm like, what's my login, blah, 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 all this. Because they're all AMC products, they all utilize the same, your same login that you create for one. They work for all the rest. Nobody ever told me that all those years. Finally figured it out. <laughs> and I thought I would share it with you. So obviously the most popular is, these are some of the more popular products that we are going to use on a regular basis as coordinators, as um, postgraduate coordinators. But, um, but you may use some others. So, but these are the ones that I remembered. So ARIS for programs, or it's also called the PDWS system. It's called, the PDWS stands for Program Director Workstation. And a little very quick history, the reason it's called that is because before ARIS decided to go completely online, you would have to download a software every single year for that year on your, um, on your computer. And you as a coordinator were the only one to access it. Um, I think the reason it's called Program Director Workstation, not Program Coordinator Workstation, is because we've many, many, many years ago, before there was a need for coordinators, program directors did all this stuff on their own with the help of us, an assistant, when needed. Um, there's the other section that you'll never have access to, but it's good for you to know, is the errors for applicants. The errors for applicant software is completely different than our software. Um, it, the information that they put in there and how they look it up is going to be completely different the way that we're going to look at it. So they put their stuff in, it goes through the little cyberspace portal, hallway, tunnel, whatever you want to call it, into our software. So that's how that, that works. I think I've only actually seen a glimpse of their software once and it was because a medical student was asking for my help for something. And I was curious. Then there's a database called Frida. Now, you're going to test me on what FRIA stands for. And this is another tag me uh, terminology. Um, it's FRIDA, it's 
I don't know it completely, but I think it's Fellowship Residency Electronic Information Database, and I don't remember what the A stands for. It doesn't matter. I don't need to know. <laughs> but um, it's a database that all programs um, of all the programs in ARIS. So what that means is when an applicant decide their medical school or wherever they're at in their training, and they're like, okay, I'm getting ready to go apply for programs. Where am I going to apply to? So they go into the Frida system and they put in all their aspects that are important to them to to um, in a program and things like that and like location, uh, resources they have, benefits they have, um, what kinds of training they do, special tracks they may have, blah 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 blah, all that. They put in their fil their their filter requests and then they come that comes back with that information. And you're probably like, how do they get that information? And how they get that is by something called the GME track. And the GME track you're probably familiar with, and you probably didn't really realize or understood what the heck it was and what it did. And this is what it does. It feeds that information to Frida so that medical students and interested applicants can look for and find your program. So it's very important little survey that I don't think that we always realize is as important. Honestly, the survey is more important than your website because you're gonna feed it back to your website and you're these candidates are probably not going to individually go look at every single website of programs they're interested in. They will for the ones that are more interested. So you should have your website updated, but you should concentrate more on the GME track because the GME track is going to lead to your website. So the other note on, so GME track has two parts to it. There's the first part that is done, that is due in July, that is called the program survey that feeds that information directly to Frida. So of course that goes to a public database. There's a second part that happens and is due at the end of August that's called the resident survey. It's all part of the same system. Um, but that is where you put in information about your, your current residents, graduating them to the next level in the system, adding the new people, and of course, um, graduating the people that are leaving your program for whatever reasons. Um, that information does not get fed into the public database of Frida, but it's used for the AMC um, uh, reporting purposes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, then there is a system called Find a Resident that is a very little known system that is actually useful, especially for the programs over the, out there that have unopened slots and you're freaking out about well, how am I going to fill the slot. One resource is after match, whether it be main match, fellowship match, they will not post the positions until after match because they have an agreement with NRP. Um, but it's where you can post positions for these open slots. It's very little, not, I shouldn't say very little known, it's a lesser known um, resource out there that's completely free to the programs and to the applicants. So, um, so it is a resource that I think more programs should use. I've used it a few times in previous programs. Um, the, last, um, the last important system or product that they use is called the LORP, and that is the Letter Recommendation Portal. This is the where the portal, this is the portal where letter writers like your program director, your chair, various faculty are going to submit their letters of recommendations on a particular candidate. And obviously you're not the ones writing letters of, of recommendation, but we all know that we do um, we do support our, our faculty and help getting them in there when they need that little extra help. So basically what this is is a medical student or whoever applicant interested in applicant, um, they're like, okay, I'm getting my applications ready. I want my letter writer. I have decided who my letter writers are for my application for this time frame or for this program, these group of programs I'm applying to. So now I gotta get all my letters of recommendation. So they put their letter writers in their system, their heirs for applicant system. And then they'll just like a lot of LORs are done anymore online, an email should go out to that particular person that says um, you've been requested to write a letter, blah, blah, blah. And of course they get busy and they don't do it. So then the, the medical student, or I keep saying medical student, I mean applicant, is going to um, print off that piece of paper and say, hi, Dr. X, I know you're really busy, but I really, really would like you to be my letter writer, blah, 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 blah. They probably already asked them ahead of time before they submitted them, but, um, but everybody gets busy. So then they give them a piece of paper and on that piece of paper, it'll say, um, where they go, which is the website here, that they have to log in. They log in with their AMC numbers that are associated with the LRP. And then they, um, they, there's um, a number, like a number code that's associated with that medical student. 
and um, and then when they say, okay, I'm ready to upload this letter, they type in that number to associate that letter to that person. There's of course a deadline for this because this has to go up in time for us to get the information that we need. This is the main reason I think that this pat this year that Eris was um, was delayed as long as it was because it, they knew it was going to be harder for them to get those letter writers from the um, from the faculty uh, because the medical students are they can get that information just fine except for it it is slowing them down with getting their transcripts and things like that because there has been a lot of delays with the transcripts especially from foreign medical schools. Um, but anyways, that's another topic. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so then they have to upload it, blah, blah, blah. And most faculty are used to it by now because I'm not even sure how many years this has been in effect, but it's been like five I, at least that I know of. But, um, but yeah, but sometimes you'll get your faculty member that just isn't good with these things. And they'll come to you and say, can you do this for me? Here you go. And then that's what it is. So you can log in on their behalf if they give you their login. But remember, it is associated with their AMC ID. That's why I tell you. It's going to come across your desk, even if you've got the most like together faculty or whatever, um, it's still at least one time is it going to come across your desk. So the AMC actually has many great products and resources and education for all of us within medical education, not not just faculty, but all of us. Um, I've been following their LinkedIn page for years and I get so much great information out of that. Um, so I suggest that if you are wanting to learn more and understand the cutting edge of what's happening in the medical education community in the country, um, it's a great resource. Also, they have a few Twitter pages. I, I follow the AMC Today page. I think I follow the professional development page too, but there are the Twitter handles if you're interested. So, because I, you're probably like, why did you tell me all this? Aren't we talking about Eris? But the reason I told you all that is because um, it's better to understand how they link together so you can one, figure out how to find it and two, understand these the, the login. So um, because Ares is an AMC product, the web address is not easy to type. It's not like, um, like, like you know, acgme.org where it's just acgme and you're gonna find it quickly. Um, you can't type in ares.org or pws.org and find it. You're just, it's not gonna happen because it's part of this AMC. So the, the, and the AMC is actually associated with the AMA. So the, web, the website is like something like www.ama-amc.org backslash, and I remember the rest. And that's why I'm telling you this because I'll never remember the rest, even though I've been logging into it for many years. Um, so the best way to look for it is just go into your Google bar, type PDWS and you will find it. If you don't have access to your program yet, or you're not sure, or it's not showing up, or you don't know what to do next, is um, contact your, your GME office is going to be your best resource because they um, are usually the people that give the coordinators access. But if you are in a, a large enough program that you do have another super user in your, your program, um, or your program director sometimes, um, they can get you access. When that happens, um, oh yeah, the other note is this needs to be done for all of your programs. So if you manage a residency and a bunch of fellowships or just several fellowships or whatever, you need you need to do this individually for each of those programs. Um, you will get what's called a token via email from the AAMC and you'll follow the link. Um, I'm telling you all that, obviously we're going to be, what happens is the link expires. I think it's like 90 days or something like that. And obviously us coordinators can do that within 90 days. But later on, you're going to learn how to add um, other users. So sometimes the faculty are not good at following it in 90 days. So it's good to understand the process. Usually, I don't add faculty until I know they're like readily available to follow through on the instructions of getting the access. Because what needs to happen is if they have an AMC account, they have to link it to that. And of course, they're always going to be like, I don't remember. I was in medical school at the time. Well, not really, but, and that brings me to my next point is that the account belongs to you forever and will follow you. And I found this one out on my own. Um, when I first got my, my first uh, PDWS account, I think it was PDWS, I think it was the program survey, because my first program was a fellowship that didn't use ARIS. Um, and I found, and at that time, there weren't very many online 
uh, things that you had to do, not like now, but because I've been doing this for 12 years now, and I had signed up, like I would sign up for the accounts for the program on everything that I created. And um, then I found out, I, I so I name it after the program, not me, because I didn't want my name around there forever. And, um, and I found out that it followed me. So the name of my account has to do with my first program I was part of.